right, welcome to video two. We're just calling this a taste of Confucius. This is our first video uh, directly on Confucius. And um, what I'm going to do here is provide a little bit of the historical background that I want you to know. And then we're going to get into the discussion of Confucian thought via NLX 1-2 and the um, idea of studying Confucius through uh, studying key Confucian ideas. So just to review, um, Confucius is the Latinization of the man's name. In uh, Chinese, he was known as Kongzhe, or Master Kong. Um, the book that I have given you uh, contains, the book that I've assigned you, contains uh, the uh, a selection of the Analects, and some of the commentary on them, as well as a, a lot of other stuff that provides background information, preface, introduction, glossary, and you need to be using all of that to properly digest this material. Okay, so one thing that I want you to know to understand the book is just a, a little bit, a slice of the historical background. So rather than um, learning all of the dynasties of all of China, um, which is just an outrageous task. Um, I just want you to think, know the five periods right around when Confucius was living. And these you really kind of have to understand in order to understand what Confucius was up to. So we're gonna look at the, the Shang, the Zhou, the Eastern Zhou, the Qin, and the Han. Or Han. Um, so these are the five dynasties right around that. And Confucius lives in the middle of this stretch. He lives during the Eastern Zhou, um, specifically during a period called uh, the Warring States period. But um, when we, we go, if we want to go all the way back, the earliest confirmed dynasty, large scale civilization in China is the Shang Dynasty. This is from the, the second millennium BCE. This is the, where you can see the origin of Chinese writing um, the, uh, in the form of uh, something called the Oracle Bones. We'll talk about that um, in a second. The Shang were followed by the Zhou, which was another prosperous period in Chinese history. And this is the period that Confucius looks back to as a golden age. So one of the things you need to understand to understand Confucius is that he was living in a time of chaos, um, sort of a post-apocalyptic time. There had been a big civilization that had collapsed. Um, and that big civilization is the, is, is the Zhou. Um, his period is called the Eastern Zhou because there was still... Um, some uh, semblance of the original Zhou dynasty. And he's living in a province called Lu um, in the east. Uh, all this period of chaos ends after the death of Confucius when uh, 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 the Qin dynasty is formed. And this is the first, this is thought of as the first unification of China. Um, the Qin emperor actually is the um, uh, our word our English word China comes from Qin um, and so they created a lot of what we now think of as Chinese civilization created a unified system of writing a system of measurements money started uh, building major infrastructure projects like the Great Wall um, and then the Han Dynasty is, follows the Qin Dynasty, um, and this is when Confucian thought becomes in, uh, put in place as the state religion. Um, and so you need to understand that to understand sort of what's going on with Confucius. There was a decline. Confucius lived in the period of decline, and then there was a, a return of large-scale um, unified government and, uh, you know, um, massive civilization. And in that, in, in the return of the large-scale dynasties, um, Confucianism became 
uh, installed as the official state philosophy, the thing that allowed the, the, this large empire to function. So I'm just going to hit some of these details uh, a little, uh, each of these dynasties in a little bit more detail. So the Shang give us the, <coughs> the Shang are the first historically documented rulers of China. There are legendary rulers uh, tied to uh, Chinese gods prior to the Shang, but this is a period of time that we know of, uh, we can confirm archaeologically. Um, so the Shang worshipped uh, a god called Shang Di, the god on high, and they practiced ancestor worship. So one of the things that I think happens to American students studying other cultures is you, uh, they tend to view all religion through the filter of Christianity, or at least the major monotheisms like Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, <clears throat> Chinese religion is, is quite different, um, but a, a key feature in this is, is ancestor worship. You're, uh, uh, you know, you're supposed to respect your elders, um, and then your, your ancestors who have passed on are your link to the gods. Um, the other thing that goes on is uh, we see the beginning of Chinese writing in this period with what are called the oracle bones. And so I've got a visual for one of those now. Um, and these were uh, bits of um, some shell or uh, they, they weren't always bone, but um, they had writing on them and then you would break them in a fire and you could predict the future based on the pattern of cracking. Um, so the earliest Chinese writing is firmly um, uh, tied to the to religious practices and uh, divination, the idea that you could try and predict the future. So the Shang um, uh, dynasty fell, um, and the idea of the religion transformed. Um, Shang Di, the god on high, became uh, heaven. Tian, um, as the so Tian is the supreme religious object, and heaven is or Tian is sometimes portrayed the way God is portrayed in a lot of the Christian literature as an anthropomorphic figure. That is, it's it has human-like characteristics. Other times, not. Um, but the main thing that happens here um, is that the Shang. Uh, one role of Tian, uh, of heaven, is to bless earthly rulers, um, sort of a, an equivalent of the European divine right of kings. Um, in Chinese, you had the Tian Ming, uh, the mandate of heaven. And so the Shang were said to lose power because they lost the mandate of heaven. Um, under the Zhou, ancestor worship continued. And this was, again, the golden age that Confucius looks back on. A lot of important books were written at the time. So Confucius feels that the study of literature is vital for a noble person. And uh, the, when he thinks of literature, he thinks of books that were written during this time, including especially the Book of Odes, which is a collection of uh, song lyrics, poetry, um, and the Book of Documents. Other crucial concepts um, for Confucius were developed this, at this time, including the idea of ritual, of gentlemen, of Wu Wei, and we'll be discussing all of these crucial concepts um, uh, later on. Uh, the important thing here is that Confucius didn't see himself as inventing new philosophical ideas. He was an expert in the philosophical ideas that had come down to him from the prior golden age of the, of the Zhou dynasty. So what happens around 800 BCE is that the Zhou empire falls apart. Um, and uh, this is this, and what's left of it is um, 
kind of nominal, right? So in the state of Lu, where um, uh, Confucius lived, there were still nominal Zhou rulers, but actually what was going on, all the real power lay with a, a, a group of gangsters called the Three Families. And you'll see references to the Three periodically. Um, and so this is one of the things that um, really uh, makes Confucius sad and angry about the era that he lives in. Um, the rightful rulers who practiced with nobility and the mandate of heaven um, are there, but they're just shells. They're, and the, all the real power lies with warlords and gangsters and that sort of thing. Um, interestingly, this is a very philosophically fertile time. Um, and uh, sometimes people speculate that actually times of social upheaval are really good for novel philosophy. People have to rethink things. Um, I don't know. It, we're also dealing just historically, it's about contemporaneous, you know, within a couple hundred years of um, the time of Plato and Socrates in um, uh, Greece and with the writing of the Bhagavad Gita in India. Um, so a set of our readings are all from roughly the same time period, but three different parts of the world. So after Confucius's death, the period of chaos ends with the uh, arrival of the Qin dynasty. And the Qin emperor is the first person to unify all of China for the first time. And in some, and so for that reason, he's often called the first emperor of China. Um, his rule, however, was not based on Confucian ideas. He followed a school of philosophy called legalism, which is a useful philosophy to have when you're running a large empire. We'll talk about that more later. During this period of time, Confucian teaching was actually suppressed. Um, but what the Qin emperor was able to do was install a lot of the um, mechanisms, the technologies that allow large-scale civilization to be possible. Standardized units of money, standardized systems of writing, standardized units of measurement. Um, these are sort of bureaucratic technologies, really, that allow us then to build physical technologies. And so you started seeing huge infrastructure projects, including the famous Great Wall of China, um, great works of art like the Terracotta Warriors here um, depicted, um, canals, bridges. Um, it was a hell of a 15 years or 16 years. Uh, and it didn't actually last long but it uh, established the imperial order that was to, you know, continue under various names for thousands of years. It was followed by the Han Dynasty. Under the Han Dynasty, the um, uh, Confucian teaching became the official government of philosophy, government government philosophy. And the Confucian teaching absorbed a lot of legalism. It kind of had to in order to actually properly run the, the empire. Um, state exams were established um, based on Confucian teaching. So if you wanted to move up in society, the way to do it was to get a job in the government with the, with the, with the emperor. Uh, and the way to get a job with the emperor was to be smart and pass test, a test or a series of tests. These Confucian exams on Confucius. So they start in the Han Dynasty and they continue actually up till 1905 with the end of Imperial China. Um, uh, contemporary ethnic Chinese often call themselves ethnically Han and that is a reference back to this dynasty. Okay, so that's the, that's the period right around Confucius. You see decline um, from large-scale uh, civilization to disordered small-scale civilization, and then return to large-scale imperial civilization. 
So the other thing I wanted to do in this presentation is talk about uh, approaching Confucian thought through Confucian terminology. And so I had you do an exercise based on uh, Analex 1 2, the second, the second passage in the Analex, um, which uh, talks about the relationship between four crucial Confucian terms. So let's just take a look at this. Um, a, a traditional Confucian education would often just consist of the teacher reading a passage of Confucius out loud and then everyone commenting on how what they think it means. Um, and so sometimes I feel like I want to use that kind of Confucian education as well. In any case, this passage is not actually from Confucius. This is a quote from uh, one of his followers, uh, Master Yu or Yuja. Um, and we'll talk about the him when we talk about the role of the disciples of Confucius. But right now we'll just say that this is, you know, a student of Confucius reflecting Confucian thought. And what he says is, a young person who is filial uh, and respectful of his elders rarely becomes the kind of person inclined to defy his superiors. And there has never been a case of one who is disinclined to uh, defy his superiors, stirring up a rebellion. A gentleman applies himself to the roots. Once the roots are firmly established, the Tao will grow. Might we not say that filial piety and respect for elders constitutes the root of goodness? So there's a lot to unpack here. Um, for starters, there's this word filial that you may not even know. Um, uh, so, well, we'll t talk about that and then we'll go back. So uh, filial is, uh, filial piety is the virtue of being respectful and dutiful to one's parents and elders. Filial means referring to the duties of a child. Um, it's an English word, but you don't hear it as much because um, respect for elders isn't as crucial a value in Western society as it is uh, in Eastern society, as particularly in China. And you might be thinking, well, I was raised to respect my elders. Um, and maybe you were, but uh, maybe not as much as uh, what the Confucians would have you do it. Um, part of this is because Confucian society is based on ancestor worship. Um, you go far enough back in your family tree and you are in the realm of the gods. And it, um, I mean, I, sometimes in um, American culture, you see talk about respect for ancestors. I'm seeing that more in like some activist circles, civil rights circles. But um, the, uh, for the most part, there's nothing like a p organized practice of ancestor worship here. But obviously, um, if your great, 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 great grandfather is a god, then, you know, your grandfather's closer to god, and your father's the closest person to god in your immediate life. So the passage that we just read says that filial piety is the root of all the other virtues. Let's take a look at this again. So the first paragraph talks about how um, if, you, if you respect your parents, you will obey your superiors. And if you obey your superiors, you will not foment rebellion. Um, Confucian philosophy was a political philosophy um, he was aiming, uh, his goal was to teach the people who would be the immediate ministers and um, advisors to an emperor or another, uh, a similar ruler. So avoiding civil unrest, avoiding rebellion, keeping an orderly society is a crucial value here. So Master Yu begins by noting that um, obedience respect 
is taught initially is respect for parents, right? Um, and then that gets transferred to respect to government and state and ultimately God. Um, so the second paragraph then moves from this observation about politics to an observation about what it means to be a gentleman. Um, and uh, so now we need to unpack the other terms because it's, it's in the second paragraph that we see the relationship between four key Confucian terms. Filial piety, gentleman, goodness, and Dao. Um, let's talk. About, so I just talked about filial piety. Filial piety is the root of all these other things. So a gentleman applies himself to the root, which is filial piety. What, is it, what do we mean by gentleman here? Um, so the term gentleman is junza, and it originally just meant son of a lord. Um, so like the English word gentleman, it's first meaning had to do with um, inherited aristocracy, right? Um, if your father was a, a king, you will become a king. If your father was a duke, you will become a duke, right? So you're a gentleman in that orig in original sense just meant royalty. Um, under Confucius, it comes to mean any person who is worthy of respect or an accomplished person. So what Confucius does is he moves the focus from inherited nobility to people who deserve to be thought of as noble. This is part of Confucius's general philosophy of focusing on actual moral worth as the source of order in society, right? Um, and so pretty much all we want to do here is recognize is that learning the traits of a gentleman for Confucian uh, for learning the traits of a Confucian gentleman is crucial to understanding the Confucian ethic. Confucius was primarily someone who taught people who were going to be noble and just rulers of a society, and so we need to understand what Confucius thinks of that. The first thing we see is that. A gentleman practice, pr applies himself to the roots, which means respect for elders, filial piety. All right. Two other key terms here, benevolence um, and Tao. Um, benevolence is uh, the term ren, and actually like the term gentleman, it originally had a more narrow meaning, just associated, uh, honestly, with um, a warrior aristocracy. So the term originally meant manly, right? So a gentleman was manly. This is ruled by warrior aristocracy. Um, under Confucius, again, there's this focus away from simple description of like warrior aristocracy towards genuine morality. And so it becomes... Ren becomes a term for people in, who are morally good in general. There's a narrowing after Confucius, particularly with Mencius. Um, oh, wait, before I get to Mencius. Confucius says, uh, uses benevolence or Ren as such a, or goodness, as such a term of respect that sometimes he says, I don't even know what real goodness is. Um, but uh, that's what I'm still looking for. Confucius is really uh, consistently honest in his self-appraisal. Um, he'll talk about what he knows and what he doesn't and what he's still trying to learn. We'll see this more when we get to Confucius as a teacher and a student. Um, later Confucians, like Mencius, associate... Um, Ren specifically with uh, kindness or generosity, humaneness. Um, so you can see the evolution of the term over time. Your translator Sl Singer Slingerland generally uses the term goodness here because for um, Confucius, it's a general broad uh, goodness. Um, benevolence, which is what I've got as the header here, 
refers more to like Mencius's later usage. All right. Dao. Dao is the hardest term, and we're going to leave it untranslated most of the time. Uh, it literally means way, like a path or uh, uh, maybe a method. Um, we leave it untranslated. Uh, it could refer to an ethical path, like the path of a gentleman is the way of a gentleman, right? Um, the Tao of a gentleman. But it's also like the metaphysical order of the universe. Confucius lived in a morally ordered universe. His contemporaries had fallen away from that order, but nevertheless, the, or the universe itself had a moral order which you were supposed to adhere to. That was the moral order that was the Tao of heaven, right? Um, later, uh, uh, a later school called the Taoists are going to grab this Confucian notion of Tao and radicalize it. We'll also talk about that later. So let's just go back to the passage. A gentleman, so that's a noble person, someone who's worthy of respect, applies himself to the roots. Once the roots are established, the way, the Tao, will grow. That this is the way of heaven, the path of heaven, also the path of the gentleman. Filial piety, respect for your elders, is the root of general goodness, or later on they'll say benevolence. All right, so that's your taste of Confucius. You got uh, some historical background and a few key terms from Analex 1-2. Um, next up, you're actually going to read a little bit of Confucius's follower, Mencius, and we're going to talk about the role of argument in Confucian thought.